All right, everybody, welcome to uh, today's Zoom event. We are going to give folks a couple of minutes to hop on, one or two minutes, and we will begin the Zoom. Thank you very much. All right, without further ado, Governor Terry McAuliffe. Thank you, Jake, and thank you everybody for joining us today for this webinar. We have, we have folks from all over the country with us today, and of course, people all over from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, I thank you for joining us on this very, very important topic. As you all know, near and dear to my heart, making sure we give people second chances, making sure that we lift all Virginians up and as you know, I had a, a lot of challenges when I went into the governorship, erasing old Jim Crow laws and so forth and restored the rights. I ultimately 200,000 more Virginians today have their right to vote back after the executive action I took in April of 2016. I think we all know the Republicans sued me, sued me for contempt of court. We ultimately won. This wasn't a political battle. To me, this was a moral issue. This was a civil rights issue, giving people a second chance at life also, I wanted to lean in on other big issues. I, at the time, I had the most pardons of any governor uh, in Virginia history, people who were given inordinately long sentences. If you were a young black or brown child and versus a young white child, you got a disproportionately longer sentence. So we leaned in. My job as governor, I felt, was to restore people's rights, give people a second chance at life, and go back and erase these horrible indignities and injustices that so many people had faced. So, you know, as governor, I was known as the jobs governor, education job governor. I really, my most proudest moment was the work I did to give people second chances at life because that, that's why I ran for governor. And I have two very special people with me today who, whose lives I, I was able to impact. I am so proud of that. Uh, we have Eric Branch who, We'll talk about his restoration of rights and what it means to him to be a full citizen of the Commonwealth of Virginia and back voting and really has been an inspiration getting other people. And then my great friend, Lenny Singleton, who is there with beautiful Vanda, the both of you, I thank you for joining us today. And Lenny, as you know, uh, I tell the story all over the country uh, and he'll tell it too, but the idea <laughs> that for $500, this young man was sentenced to two life sentences and 150 10 years in prison is an absolute disgrace. And there were many people who stepped up to the plate to help. So uh, let's get right into it. Let me turn it right over to you, Lenny. Why don't you go first? And Vanda, great to see you again. Hope everything's going great out there. And why don't you lead us off and sort of talk a little bit about your experiences, how you got to where you were and really what the impact going forward and how we can help other people, Lenny. Absolutely, Governor. Uh, Thank you for having me today too. As the governor said, my name is Lenny Singleton and I'm with my amazing wife, Vandy Singleton. Uh, I just wanna say how important it is that men be given a second chance. But more importantly, I wanna talk about why it's important also to reelect someone like Terry McAuliffe as governor of Virginia. And I don't want to start with just my crimes because I've met some people since I've been out and I've only been out for two years and six months. And I've met some people who think that, you know, our lives consist of the crimes we committed, but there's so much more to us than just the crime. You know, I was born in upstate New York in 1967, moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1978, 
where I was a pretty darn good football player. As a matter of fact, my wife says that I was a star athlete. I don't know about all that, but well, I was good Tanner enough to obtain. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> and amazingly, Governor McAuliffe, we attended a high school that was intentionally created to bridge the gap between the races because of the 1921 race riot that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yep. We went to a magnet school and Vandy and I met in algebra class. <laughs> so anyway, I received a full athletic scholarship, attended Langston University in Langston, Oklahoma, graduated with my degree in business, minor in programming, entered the United States Navy in 1991, had those aspirations to get some managerial experience, travel the world and obtain my MBA. Well. The worst mistake I could have ever made was using cocaine at a party one night. And Governor, that one night just took me on a, I mean, I just lost complete control of my life. And then within one week, I had several grab and dash robberies where I, when the cash register opened, I would snatch money out of the cash register and run out of the store. Well, this happened for an, for an entire week before I was apprehended. And in one of those grab and dash robberies, I did have a butter knife. When the detective arrested me, it was anybody I thanked him, Governor. I, was no physical injured? injuries. I never used a gun. Yeah. No injuries whatsoever. I told my wife I would have never hurt anybody uh, behind that. But I thanked the detective and I told him everything that I had done. I even went to court and I pled guilty because, you know, I, I looked at this as an opportunity to get myself together. And I wanted some help for, that, for my addiction. Well, I walked out of a Norfolk courtroom. And mind you, I only stole, and I shouldn't say only, I don't want to belittle what I did because I was wrong. But the total amount that I stole was $511 in that one week crime spree. I walked out of that Norfolk courtroom receiving two life sentences plus 110 years. My recommended guidelines, Governor, were 11 to 18 with a midpoint of 15 years. This judge didn't even explain why he felt like a first time offender who didn't hurt anybody, who stole $511 deserved to die in prison. And I was scheduled on paper to die in prison. And he didn't give you any So while incarcerated, money. he didn't, Governor McAuliffe, he didn't say a word. Wow. He, as a matter of fact, my family flew in from Michigan, Oklahoma, New York, my dad, my aunts, everyone was there in the courtroom that day. And he issued that kind of time, hit his gavel and said, next case. So like you were saying, the only reasoning that we could come up with was like you said, I'm an African-American because yep. I don't think any white person my age would have gotten a sentence like that, yep. especially with no felony background. So while I was incarcerated, I mean, I went through my highs and lows, of course, being sentenced to die in prison, but I was able to get a good job. I worked for Virginia Correctional Enterprises for the majority of my incarceration. I was in the honor building. And while I was doing all that, I was writing all the organizations that were talking about criminal justice reform, excessive sentencing, and uh, never got any responses. They all said that they, they didn't have the resources to allocate. This was before you were elected governor in the first term. So after 17 years of doing this governor, my brother shows up. His name is Lionel Maven. He's a retired Air Force serviceman. He pops up and I hadn't seen him or talked to him in 20 years. And he popped up and he says, Lenny, I'm gonna do everything I can to get you out. He built the Justice for Lenny webpage. He built, he built the Facebook page for me, trying to get my story out. Well, that's how Vandy found me. After searching for 28 years. Wow. She had been looking for me for 28 years. And I'm like, why? <laughs> well, the reason why was because he stood up in algebra and, and announced to everybody that he said, Vandy Hill, I just love you. 
you know, that kind of sticks with someone. <laughs> so maybe good. announces yeah, yeah. to a whole class that they love that. <laughs> so Bandy started writing, Everybody. emailing, texting, calling. I'm talking about thousands of letters, thousands of emails. And finally, we got the attention of a journalist named Timothy Williams of the New York Times. Yep. And he flew all the way down from New York, came to Nottaway Correctional Center, interviewed me there at the, at the facility. And uh, as a result of that article, our friend, Jason Flom, yep. saw that article. And by the way, he's here today. He said the story so moved him that he wanted to find out what he could do. And at that time, Vandy had been calling all kinds of lawyers. Lawyers even told her I was a lost cause. The lawyer said, if any lawyer takes your, takes your money, they're lying to you. He'll never get out. He'll never get out. And so we wound up finding the attorney that you had an opportunity to meet in DC, John A. Cogshill out of Norfolk, Virginia. He yep. took my case and we all worked together and putting the petition together to present to you. Mind you though, I had already filed a conditional pardon to the governor before you and they turned me flat down. And uh, so as we're moving along, moving along, um, we filed that petition, what? December 22nd. December 22nd, 2015. Yep. And- um, That was the same exact day that Timothy Williams contacted me to do a story. We knew that the universe was moving in our direction. We had Barack Obama in office. We had Terry McAuliffe as governor of Virginia. You were doing things that just had all of us inside. I mean, we were we were inspired, Governor. Honestly, you know, you were making some moves and pushing. You're inside if we're making actions on the outside trying to help you. That really reverberates through. Oh my oh, yeah. goodness. Vandy and Tay, I used to call her on the phone and tell her about the things that you were legislating, especially when you created that commission to review parole, which Vandy had an opportunity to speak at one of your commissions. And so all the guys inside the prisons, Gov uh, Governor, we were just stoked. We were excited. We sensed that something new was on the horizon. We all, you know, we were and there are more Lenny Singletons in there. There are a lot more Lenny Singletons in the prisons today who are working on themselves and they're ready to come out of there. Yeah. You know, and we talked a lot about that. So anyway, um, I got kind of lost there. Help me out there, honey. We filed the petition in December of 2015. Yeah, okay. and then got the article. Jason Flom found found saw the article. That's right. And was so moved that that he came and met with you. Yeah. And uh, from there, you know, when he received his pardon on January twelfth, two thousand eighteen. That's that correct. I'll never, never, never forget. Yeah. yeah. You know what? What Lenny hasn't said is, well, he was. I was also fighting for his life, but I was also fighting for my own. Oh. I had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. So it meant everything to me to be able to have him come home. So you are one of my personal heroes and I will be forever grateful to you. Well, I remember that first call we had when you were back together, back in the home. I remember that night, oh, man. That's right, that's right. And I remember that. But here's the kicker, Governor. When you go through this stuff, you know, this was a hardened criminal, they'd say, da, da, da. And he's going to get out and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So give me a little brief. What, let, tell me about yourself since you've been out and been an absolute model citizen, as I knew you would be. Thank you. Here's the kicker. Now, this is beautiful. My second day out, John Cox, who the attorney there in Norfolk, called my wife and I over to his office and talked about, he had a vision for perfecting pardon petitions. He knew I'd been in for 23 years. My wife, he saw the work that she had been doing. So my second day out, we talked about establishing an Eastern branch and a Western branch of the John A. Cogsha Law Firm. Since I've been out, Governor, that is exactly what we do every single day. We are helping 
other deserving inmates petitioned the governor with the hopes of getting what I was able to get and what Eric was able to get. Not only that, we, we were traveling before COVID hit. We were speaking at uh, elementary schools, shelters. We were speaking with college students online in Minnesota. Uh, here, in, here, in here in Utah, the mayor had us speak. So we were really about the business of giving back and sharing what you were able to do in the state of Virginia, where criminal justice reform is concerned. And they were all just, blow, people are just blown away that number one, I spent so much time in there. Number two, uh, the fact that my attitude was the way it was once I was released. But I always pointed to the men who really made the difference. And that was you, Governor McAuliffe. That was Jason Flom. That was John Cogshill, my brother Lionel. All these men working together to make a difference in our country. And as a result of you granting me a second chance, now I'm able, my wife and I are able to be out here uh, supporting those efforts, touching yeah. lives, inspiring, and giving hope. Listen, you're an inspiration. So you. I, mean, I talk about you and Vandy all the time, every day. People are shocked at the idea of $511. To, they I can't said, believe it. They don't believe it. You know what's on. crazy is he would have cost taxpayers over a million dollars had he, yeah, they kept yeah. him in prison all that yeah. time. For I think our buddy Jason Flom is on here. Jason, you with us? I'm here. There he is. So hey, Jason. Jason. He came down to my office. I didn't think he was telling me the truth when he told me the story. I just honestly can't believe that this actually happened. Jace, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can see me, but you can definitely hear me. You can hear you. Uh, do I need... Do I need to turn the camera on? I don't know how to, uh, yeah, it looks like it should be on. Got a camera. I don't know how the hell it, the camera should be on. I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't give me any uh, problems. Let me see. Uh, no, it doesn't give me that option. What the hell, I don't understand this. Um, Zoom, um, anyway, um, maybe somebody can do it on that end. But regardless, um, first of all, it's great to see you, Governor, and I'm mansion. Um, oh, there we go, are we still, oh, here we go. Are we there? Oh, my <laughs> so hey, there we are. So anyway, so the yeah, I just got to give you my perspective on the story. First of all, hi, Vandy, and you know she gets more, really more of the credit I think than should get more of the credit than anybody because it was her perseverance and her love uh, that that made any of this possible. Or nobody would have ever known your story, and so she's um, you know she's a hero, but. Um, but yeah, so I reached out after reading your, your, your New York Times article sat on my dining room table for months while I was trying to figure out how the hell I was going to be able to do something about it. And finally, I called a friend of mine named Ginny Grenham. I knew that she Ginny knew a Grenham. lot of people. Yep, I knew that Ginny knew a lot of people in, in positions of, of great power. And I asked her if she knew Governor McAuliffe. She said, sure, I do. I said, well, can you get me a meeting? So she said, I'll try. So she calls me up one day. She said, yeah, he said, he'll, you can come to the office. Then she calls me back and says, well, apparently somebody on the staff Googled you and now they invited you to the mansion for dinner. <laughs> and I said, oh man, this is getting, this is getting good now. <laughs> so I went to the mansion. As I recall, there was some very good wine and some very nice cigars involved. It was Virginia and, wine, let's um, be clear. Virginia wine, Jace. <laughs> Virginia wine, not Virginia cigars, I don't think, but maybe, um, who knows? <laughs> and anyway, but, you know, we talked about a number of cases. There were a lot of, uh, you know, there's about 10 people there. I think Terry and I were the last one standing. Um, but the, he kept coming back to it and saying, it's some, that, that some's not adding up here. You, you told me $500, two lives. He, he kept saying, this, this can't be right. It can't be right. The same thing that everybody says. He was like, this yeah. is ridiculous. This is crazy. This is unjust. This is, you know, and so he, um, he sent me the next day, uh, well, I should be speaking to you, Governor, you sent me the next day to see the uh, chief counsel, I think, your chief counsel. Um, and then we went through the, the you know, the, the, all the proper uh, protocols. And I want to just uh, brag about you for a minute, uh, Governor, because not only did he grant clemency, uh, did Governor McCall grant clemency to you, uh, but also to uh, three other people who were uh, I was advocating for, um, and um, 
you know, and there have been so many others as well. But on top of that, Terry came to New York for the Innocence Project Gala, sat at the table the whole night, didn't come like a politician, like looking to make a big, you know, splash and to do. He came as somebody who cared about this issue, who was touched by it personally, who was in a, a position to make a difference and actually did make a difference. And, wow. um, and, yeah. and, and then of course, uh, it was my great honor to uh, introduce you guys at the Southern Center for Human Rights dinner in DC. I think that was a moment no one will ever forget. I certainly won't. Uh, there we are, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so I think, look, it's, it's the, the, the good news is that men like, and I'll, I'm gonna stop talking in a second, but men like you, Lenny, I think are making such an incredible difference in the public perception that has really shifted now in the time since you came out, um, since that great day when we all walked you out. Um, and, yeah. um, and you were so thoughtful and so, so, so just sort of, your spirit was just so, you had this like grace that when you came out of prison and I was like, this guy's amazing. But anyway, but the, the good news is that the momentum has, the tide has turned, the momentum is real. Uh, in states, Virginia, and so many other states now, there's a real uh, movement for change. It's not happening fast enough. And I will say, last thing is that we need to do more right now to get people, as many people out as possible before they all die of COVID. More, pe more people have died in prison of COVID, COVID than have died of the death penalty in America in the last 50 years. So we're now wow. sentencing people to death people who haven't been convicted of a crime who are dying in jails, people who are elderly, vulnerable in prisons, who are defenseless against this virus. So um, listen, we need more people like uh, Governor McAuliffe in, in positions of power. Uh, and yes, we're looking we forward to having you back, uh, <laughs> Governor. Yeah. And um, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe Lenny will end up on your, uh, on your team there somewhere. You never know. I mean, he would be a great guy to work <laughs> in the... Uh, Right. In, in the justice uh, at some, some I'm, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> now, I'll, now I'll shut up before I say something I should. So well, thank anyway, you, but it's great to see you. Thank you, buddy. And I appreciate all the great work you and your team, the Innocence Project really do. The lawyers who you do this all for free, you take no money for it. And the important point that you made there, and I want to bring Eric Branch into this conversation, but the important point you made and Lenny, I just can't stress to you how important you are to all of us who fight on these issues because you have been a model citizen. And I'll be honest with you, when you're sitting there as a governor or politician, um, your staff doesn't want you to do any of this. Um, the criminal justice system doesn't want you to do anything because they don't want to a, admit they were wrong. The staff rightfully always wants to protect you. And if someone gets out and does something, oh my goodness, they're gonna come back. You know, none of that stuff ever, ever bothered me. And uh, I'm just honored to thank you, Lenny, for being such an inspiration, really, to all of us. And you're a model citizen. And you really, uh, the bad break you took is just no, no human being should ever go that. So I thank you for your positive attitude. And let me, speaking of positive attitudes, let me bring in my great friend, Eric Branch, to talk about, you know, uh, our restoration of rights work to give him back his right to vote as I did that enfranchisement order in April of 2016 and brought 206,000 people, giving them the right to vote. And for those folks on, who are watching on this today, you may not know who are not from Virginia, that we are one of the states that permanently disenfranchises you. So if you had stolen sneakers or an iPhone, something worth $200 and you're 18 years old, you never again vote for the rest of your life in Virginia. It's a remnant of a 1901 Jim Crow law we ended that and it was people, again, like Eric, who have th this order that I took, which was controversial in the Republicans' eyes, it was the right thing to do. But Eric has made me so proud uh, that we are on to step up. So Eric, you, why don't you join us if you could, buddy? Yeah, Governor, good afternoon to everybody. And um, I, I can't say enough um, about the heart of, of this man as governor um, the things that he championed uh, for his cause to rectify the laws and things that were put in place hundreds of years ago, the Jim Crow laws. Um, I was carried to a, through a judicial system in which I felt at, at the time was unfair, uh, having been a first time nonviolent uh, offender for my uh, crimes, which were just 
simple breaking and entering of a business, never committed any crimes or violence. Um, as a matter of fact, at that time, I was slated to become a state trooper, um, still kept all of my credentials from the state police in 1980 um, in the process of becoming a state trooper. Um, I lost that opportunity by making the decision to do what I did. Um, I did what I did. Um, because I became a young father at a very young age. I was in my 20s and I was struggling trying to take care of uh, a new wife and a newborn son, trying to get money to be able to take care of them. I was working a job at the city of Petersburg wastewater treatment plant. I was only making $7 an hour. And certainly back then, $7 an hour was not enough money to provide and do everything I needed to do as an as a individual. And I purely did what I did because taking on a responsibility as a man, you know, trying to do the right thing as a father and a, and a husband, even though my decision was wrong and I accept that. And now 30 some years later, I regret the actions that I did take. Um, but going through the criminal justice system at that time, there was a lot of prejudices and biases. Um, there was a multi-jurisdictional task force that was formed against me and my brother, which consisted of Chesterfield, Henrico, uh, Dinwiddie County, Petersburg. We had all these jurisdictions and the taxpayer money that went into a multi-jurisdictional task force, which, you know, it made it seem like we were hardened career criminals. And, you know, that's the way the prosecuting attorney had painted the picture. Um, and so doing... Once I went through the uh, court system, I was handed a sentence of over 60 years. Um, it, it just blew me away because I had never been convicted but prior to this of any crimes as a felony. Um, this was my first time. And I was just you know, blown away by this, the sentence that was handed me having been a first time offender. Um, but just the things that I experienced through the criminal justice system. And then so once I came home in April of 92, after serving almost five years in the state penitentiary, coming home, April of 92, I ran into an old lawyer of mine that represented me on these cases, Paul Bland. He's now passed away. And he put the idea in my head to apply for, to start the process of getting my rights back. And I found myself contributing to a democrat, uh, uh, democracy of paying taxes into a system that I had no voice. And I, I just felt like a half of a man walking around here paying into a system and not being able to have a, a say so in voting or any political issues or anything like that. So I uh, went through four governors prior to uh, Governor Terry McCullough and um, continued, you know, even though I was told no, on several different occasions, I continued to uh, file the papers. I did everything myself. I filed papers and continued to file papers and got to Governor Terry McCollis' administration, talked to a young lady. I think her name was Ms. Purdue. Um, she heard my story. Next right. thing I know, I got a phone call from the governor's office saying that, hey, we're going to restore your rights. I, I was so elated. And then it began a journey and a process of me working with a governor which had someone told me 30 years ago while I was sitting in prison that I would be doing what I'm doing now, <laughs> I wouldn't have believed it. You know, I, I would not believe that I would have the platform of, of working in the community and, and doing what I'm doing 30 years ago while I was sitting in prison. I wouldn't have never believed it. But 30 years fast forward, here I am. It's a reality. And the, the, the strides that we have made within this administration. I have attended so many events with governor. I've traveled to Norfolk with him. Um, we went down to Norfolk to do a restoration of rights down there. I mean, just to see so many people's lives touch on this one subject. And now I see that he's bringing in education and what he's trying to do as far as for school teachers and you know, trying to reach uh, the African-American community, you know, children at, at risk, you know, especially in the black and brown community, get money into the school systems and help with that. That impresses me because here's a person that has a heart that I can say is for the people. 
And right. I don't care. I have gone online and I've seen on some of the Facebook uh, comments and so forth about him and so forth. I've even went to bat for him and put comments when someone would say something negative because he is a person that I take it personal because when you experience something like I have experienced, because I tell many of people, unless you walked in my shoes, you don't know what it is for my experience. Because for me as an African-American man and have suffered so many things at the hands of law enforcement and so forth, I can remember times of being pulled over just because I was an African-American and I was driving a certain kind of car. I mean, the things that we hear today, I was experiencing it in, this, in, the, in the 80s and the things that I experienced in the 60s, I mean, in the 70s as a young black man growing up in the Commonwealth, I've been here in the Commonwealth all my life. So I dare anybody to stand to me and say, you know, I don't know this and I don't, I've been here in the Commonwealth. I've been a citizen of the Commonwealth all of my life. I've never lived anywhere else. I've been born and raised right here in Richmond um, at VCU Hospital, the old VCU. But, you know, just seeing the things that he has done as a human being and as a man that, that speaks volumes to me as an African-American that says that he's, he's for the people, be it for education or restoration of rights. I've never seen a politician or a governor or have whatever title you want to assign to him. I've never seen a leader step up to the plate and take on an issue and didn't care what the status quo said. He went against what they said. He overcame it. His administration worked to get it done. I was part of the process. And when you are in the trenches with an individual and you know what's going on, you've been a part of the experience, it has much more impact than someone standing on the sidelines. I remember years ago, President Obama wrote me a letter from the White House and he said to me in his letter, and I hold, I hold this letter right here straight from the White House that says, don't be on the sideline, get involved with the political process in your area. And that's what I did. I got involved with the process. And for me, I am continually fighting. There's several individuals I've helped get their rights restored. They're doing great things in the community. One person is going on and became a correction officer in DOC. And he used to be in DOC, he used to be an inmate. Now he's a correction officer. And there's no stories like that. That, in, that touched my heart. And, and, and I can come back and, and report it to Governor Terry that as an extension of what he did for me, look at what I did in the community to help others. It started with him, with his idea and his dream and his desire. And it's passed, being passed on. People like Lenny, you know, I, I'm just so touched by everything that the governor has slated to do in, in this upcoming a platform that he is creating, be it for education, be it for just the Commonwealth itself, restoration of rights, criminal justice reform, all of the things that I've had a privy of, of being a part of understanding and knowing of what he's trying to do. The only thing I can do is speak to the Commonwealth and say, this person by the name of Terry McAuliffe is for the Commonwealth of Virginia. He's for the people. I don't care what nobody else say. All I can say the acid test for me is what he has done for me as an individual. Nothing else matters outside of that. And I know that this man is gonna to continue to push for greater change and diversity. I can see greater things ahead once he is elected as governor again. I truly believe in my heart. My faith tells me that he is going to become governor again because I know God will not fail. He puts people in position he, he does what he wants to do as God, and I truly believe that he is going to be back in the office as governor for another four years. Well, thank you, Eric, and I, I want you right at my side. One thing, Eric, could you mention, because I don't think people understand how important it was for you and to others to get your right to vote back. What does it feel like when you come out of prison and you are disenfranchised personally, because the stories I always heard when I was campaigning is I'd have 
fathers come up to me at things I'd like to get my rights back. And that's where I really started paying attention because they'd say, you know, I can never vote for the rest of my life. This is unfair. They would go to like polling booths on election day and get one of those I voted stickers and put it on their lapel and they'd go home because they were embarrassed to tell their children they could not vote. People should not have to live like that. So give me a little of your experiences, Eric, what you felt like being a second class citizen, how important it was to actually get that piece of paper so I can vote again. You know, Governor, when you did what you did for me, I broke my neck to get to the first opportunity to vote. I did not <laughs> wait one moment when that was, re was granted back to me. I refused to sit on the sideline and let another election go by. I posted on Facebook my first time voting after being uh, restored. I posted it on Facebook because that was a proud moment for me that it was priceless. I mean, just having being out here in a society, in a community, and knowing you cannot vote, it just does something to me when I see people that have the right to vote and they don't exercise it. And I always say, you don't miss something until it's taken away from you. That's right. And, and for me, you know, it has been my, 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 my desire to reach people and tell them, no matter what, be a part of the process. Don't complain about the outcome if you're not being in the process. A lot of people just sit back a lot of times and don't take the opportunity to vote. But for me, it was such an exhilarating feeling. It was like the weight of the world mm -hmm. was lifted off of my shoulders. I felt like I was restored. I remember, and if I may share, this was a photo of you and I. Oh yeah. Down at the state capitol. Yep. And I'll never forget it. As I stood at that podium, the very words that was on this monument touched me in such a way because it read, it seemed like reaching for the moon. And that was a quote from Barbara Johns at the memorial statue. Right. For years, I dealt with that feeling of, of not having my rights restored, just living out here and doing, going about day to day. It, this, this situation felt like I was reaching for, for the moon. And to be there at that moment with you, it was like it was accomplished. And then what touched me the most is when you signed both of these photos, the other one, you said Eric for governor, and then you signed it, autographed it. This was the other one of you and I. And I'll never forget, this was your way of telling me, Eric, there's nothing impossible to you That's if true. you desire to achieve it. And it meant so much to me. I kept this photo and I framed it because I never had anybody to say those things to me. And I, for years, walked around with that thought, Eric for governor. And I'm like, this man is telling me there's nothing impossible. That's right. And the other one, how you autographed it and say, Eric, thank you for your leadership. You know, I can't say as I speak to the public, you may have your opinion about Governor Terry McCullough, but one thing I can say is he's a great man. And I say that because of what he has proven himself and showed himself to do, not just for myself, but for people like Lenny, and thousands of others. The proof is in the pudding. Thousands of others. So if well, anybody dared to come- a great leader. If anybody <laughs> dared sorry, to come into my face and try to dissent on what I'm saying, his record speaks for himself. Mm -hmm. His record as governor, he did great things for the Commonwealth in the area of the economy. He, he, he expanded the growth of opportunities for the Commonwealth. All I saw time and time again, great things coming out of, is he a perfect man? No, I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. But one thing I can say is he tried to push for change to make things better. Yeah, there was those that wanted to stay in the old era of how things work, but we are moving forward. It's progressive. And for anybody to want to stay stuck, 
in the hundred a hundred years ago or Jim Crow era, I can't see how you can be a part of the Commonwealth. And that's why I even I, I thank God that he touched his heart and mind to say, let me do it another four years. Well, thank you for that, Eric. And Amen. listen, we had to erase 114 years of horrible racial disenfranchisement. And as you know, when you take sands like that, you are going to bring a lot of people out against you. Never bothered me. In fact, that great picture you have is, so when I did the order, I clearly had the authority. Uh, A.E. Dick Howard, the constitutional scholar, was my legal advisor, but the Supreme Court made a political decision. I wrote about that in my book, Fighting White Nationalism. And they said, no, we're not going to let them do a broad order. No governor's done it before. Well, you know, that's not a constitutional theory, but so what? No one's ever been impeached either, but you can still do it. And they said he has to do it individually. And I was pretty hot then because what was really bothering me was the 206,000 people who just gotten their rights back to vote. Now here was the Virginia Supreme Court saying, no, 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 you can't vote. I mean, I just, what people went through and they said he has to do it individually. And that's when I said, get all 200,000 petitions, take them out to that civil rights where I'm gonna sign every darn one myself. And that's when you and I stood there and I announced I was signing them all individually. And as you know, the Republicans immediately sued me for contempt of court. I think I'm the only governor to ever be sued for contempt of court. You know what? <laughs> I think so. It wasn't about me. It was about all the folks out there who I was fighting for. And exactly, it always is, is that, you know, people make mistakes in life. Yes. You told me someone who's never made a mistake, I'll show you a liar. People make That's mistakes. That's right. But how do you grow from that? And how do you get people back? I want everybody back in society. I want everybody in. I want you raising families, paying taxes, and being part of your community. You can't do that if you treat people like second citizens. So the both of you and Vandy, you all have been so involved in this. And, and I really thank you. And that's why this time I'm talking about education. So I'm going to continue my fight as I had on restoration of rights and pardons. I'm going to continue to do clemencies if I'm fortunate enough to be elected again. But what I really you need know. to do the next time is to fix a broken education system where we do have racism still in education and housing yes. and affordable uh, healthcare delivery and the criminal justice system. We can't have different schools with different quality teachers and facilities. If you do that, that is inherent racism. So I've called for a big $2 billion investment for the first time in Virginia history to pay teachers above the national average, to get 40,000 at risk three and four year olds pre-K and really to make sure every right. child gets broadband because it's not fair. So that's what this, this is about. This is the team. We're all a team in this together. So I wanna thank all of you for joining with us today. Uh, uh, thank you, Lenny. Thank you, Vandy. I wanna thank you, Eric. You have been great, great friends. And you know what folks, we're just warming up. We got big things. All right. Yes. Let's do it. Right. Game on. Let's go. Sleep when you're dead. Let's do it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have Bye -bye. a good one, Governor.